everybody, my name is Sinclair Truesdale from Texas A&M University and today I wanted to talk about my project which was a review of measuring upper ocean responses to hurricanes. I wanted to learn how both our data collection methods and our understanding of these upper ocean responses has changed since the 1960s. The upper ocean is important to consider with hurricanes because they have a very complex relationship and they interact with each other in different ways. For example, the upper ocean serves as a sort of pool of energy from which hurricanes can draw from, whereas at the same time, hurricanes are inducing a lot of vertical mixing in the water column, which can drastically change how the upper ocean environment is compared to before the storm passed. And these interactions are important to consider and keep in mind when you're looking at numerical model simulations of hurricanes. This is because they can really change and have an effect on how hurricanes develop and further intensify within the model. And so data simulation of the upper ocean environment has become very important because it relates the real world environment to the theoretical one within the model and further helps these models simulate these situations more accurately. And the way we've collected this data that's used in this simulation has changed a lot since the 1960s. Back then, the most valuable data resource was merchant ship observations. And this was due to the fact that there wasn't a lot of instrumentation in the water at the time. And what these observations were showing was that there was cooling occurring following the passages of different hurricanes. And this sort of triggered early scientists to want to verify this cooling themselves and also think about the mechanisms behind this cooling. So early scientists went out on their own research expeditions and used tools like the Bathy thermograph to measure temperature with depth and were able to verify this cooling occurring and also start to wonder what other changes were occurring in the upper ocean due to these hurricanes. They also recognized there was a lack of data for them to compare before storm conditions to after storm conditions due to that lack of instrumentation. So they recognized the need for more instruments to be deployed in the water. We've come a long way since the 1960s and uh, this middle panel here, I'm showing the different in situ instrumentation we have deployed in the water today, including gliders, floats and drifters and moored systems. Each of these systems collects data in its own unique way and tells us different things about the ocean environment. For example, with gliders, they can travel along program paths and go to different depths to collect temperature and salinity and can even be programmed to travel along or through the track of a hurricane after it's passed to gain some really valuable data. With floats and drifters, this map is showing how many Argo floats are located in the water today there are over 3,900 of them, so it's really shown how much our spatial coverage of ocean data has increased since those early years. And this gives us better probability of having these sensors nearby hurricane events to gain this useful data. Moving on to our moored systems, these are very important because they're more complex than the others, and they combine a lot of the sensors to give us a lot of high quality data of different variables. For example, they tell us not only what's occurring in the ocean, but also what's occurring in the atmosphere, such as things like air temperature and the wind speed. And so we're able to see a better connection and interaction between these two boundary layers, especially when hurricanes are moving through. And uh, moored systems also highlight that limitation of in-situ instrumentation in that they can only collect data in one place at one time, which leads us to remote sensing. This has been a huge leap in this field of study because it gives scientists a bigger and very detailed picture of what happens before and after a hurricane passes through. This is an ex two examples from Hurricane Fabian, and each is showing a before and after snapshot, one with sea surface temperature and the other with chlorophyll A concentration. In this case, uh, scientists were able to learn about the ocean cooling that was occurring, especially on the right side of the storm, as well as a phytoplankton bloom that popped up after the storm passed through. So this remote sensing has also been beneficial in other fields like biological oceanography. And there are many questions that I still think we need to answer, such as how can we better understand and model hurricane interactions with cold and warm core ocean eddies? This is still something that models are struggling to resolve and accurately simulate, and so I think there needs to be more data of these uh, pre-existing eddy conditions. In addition, looking back at that phytoplankton bloom, we want to know more about that biological response, such as what are the microbes that are in those blooms and how does that change with time, as well as is it possible to predict the size and location of these blooms using hurricane data, giving scientists more time to prepare ocean expeditions to get direct measurements within these blooms? But these are questions I want to see answered in the future. In conclusion, by combining all of these instrumentations, we've gained a fuller understanding of the upper ocean responses to hurricanes, 
as well as made data simulation for modeling more powerful, leading to more accurate hurricane forecasts that is likely to continue with time. Thank you.